He is risen. He is risen indeed. Please join us this morning as we celebrate Easter by starting and singing that great hymn, Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today. Welcome to First Baptist Church of Westwood Lake. We're so glad that you have chosen to join us this morning. We just want to say Happy Easter. And also, uh, if you know the response to this one, He is risen. Exactly, He is risen indeed. And we're so thankful that you're here with us. And we just want to praise the Lord and worship Him today for uh, just the amazing resurrection. And we serve a risen Savior. We're so thankful for that. And we're glad that you've chosen to join us, and we're going to begin our service with a word of prayer. So would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we serve a risen Savior, that you have conquered sin and conquered death. And Lord, you have given us now the opportunity to do the same. And Lord, I pray your blessing on this service today. I pray that you would be honored and glorified in every single uh, aspect of this service and lord we want to just praise you and thank you and lord we are grateful that you alone are worthy of our praise and we pray now that you would bless our service and bless our time here together we ask all these things in jesus name amen we want to encourage you and invite you to worship the lord together in song with our worship team as they come and lead us in some songs this morning One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Glory revealed, revealed. 
suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He. The hands of humation stretched out on a tree and took the nails for
Just want to make a few announcements at this time and give you an opportunity to know what's kind of going on during uh, the middle of the week. Uh, in case you haven't heard, we do do a Wednesday night streaming service as well, where there's a challenge from God's Word at 7 o'clock. Also, after that, at 7.30, Pastor Garcia, he does a Spanish service as well, and we'd love to have you attend those things. Uh, for the youth group and the college ministry, there are also Zoom meetings going on, Zoom Bible studies happening at that time. And for our Awana children, uh, we still want to get you guys finished with those books and get those sections said. And so if you'll contact Mrs. Brink or Mrs. Mortensen, you can say verses to them, or they can put you in contact with some other people that you could say verses to. And we want to get those books taken care of, and so we want to give you that opportunity. We also want to give you an opportunity not only to worship with song, but also how to worship the Lord with your offerings as well. And Mrs. Thompson's going to play the piano at this time. She's going to play a special for us. And uh, we're just going to put up on the screen um, some different ways, opportunities that you have to worship the Lord with your offerings. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we're so thankful for how you meet our needs and how you take care of us. And Lord, I just pray now that you would uh, bless our time here as we worship you, not only in song, but also with our offerings. And Lord, we just want to say thank you and offer back just a little bit of what you provided for us. We ask you to take this money, use it for your honor and your glory and the furthering of your ministry. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
the master the lord reigns to life again the voice that spans our years speaking life stirring hope bringing peace to us will sound till he appears for he lives christ is risen from the dead one with the father Oh, 
Was it a morning like this? When the sun still hid from Jerusalem And Mary rose from her bed To tend the Lord she thought was dead Was it a morning like this? When Mary walked down from Jerusalem Today we're going to be focusing on 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 8, for our scripture reading this morning. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 8. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time.
Well, good morning. Thank you so much, worship team. What a beautiful service that we have already begun and been worshiping together in music and in our meditation and prayers. But today we are happy to come to you by the means of streaming. You have been a, a listening for the last number of weeks online, and thank you for joining us. We pray that the service today will be a blessing. Of course, Easter 2020 looks a lot different than all the other Easter's that we have enjoyed previously. Big families with large gathering, huge amounts of food, special church services, and of course, of all that candy that the kids really enjoy. The pandemic scare of COVID 2020 certainly has been making 2020 a different type of celebration. But may I remind you, Christ is still risen. What a message, what a message that we have that Christ is alive. Easter is Resurrection Day. Can you imagine what that first day must have been like there in Jerusalem? All the buzz of excitement in the air. It was obvious that something unusual was taking place. Yet nobody seemed to have a handle on it. And for some reason, there was a flurry of activity from the very people who were too afraid to be seen. There was this violence of the activities of the previous days that, that they came through. Surely something had happened. But what was it? It was the celebration of the resurrection of their Savior, their Messiah, Jesus Christ. Yes, despite of all the concerted efforts that have gone through the years to disprove it, the resurrection of Jesus Christ stands. We are rejoicing because of that. You know, uh, Jesus was dead. He was buried. And now he is alive. You know, these past weeks we have been isolated. I'm sure it's not been fun in your home as it's not been in ours. We have been isolated from our families, from our friends, and from our acquaintances. And now I'm kind of understanding why when I knock at a door, or when I go to somebody's home who has a dog, the very first thing they do when they open that door, the dog wants to escape. And I think that's possibly the same situation for all of us. We can't wait for the quarantine to be finished. This morning, we're looking at a very familiar passage, a passage that celebrates the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, the Bible says Jesus Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again. You see, that one theme is central throughout the first half of 1 Corinthians 15. It was the foundation of their message. It was the foundation of the gospel hope. Yes, Christ is the central theme. Yes, we have something to celebrate. This life is not all that there is. There is hope beyond the grave, for Christ defeated death and sin by conquering the grave and resurrecting his body. That's the Easter message. And, and of course, it's a fact. It's the gospel message, a message of hope, a message that we can share with our friends and our co-workers and our family that Jesus loves them and that he died for them. Christianity is a religion of hope, which is so important in our lives. You know, it is said that we can live 40 days without food. We can live eight days without water. We can live four minutes without air. But we can only live a few seconds without hope. We all desire to have hope in this life. You know, uh, the first part of our faith has everything to do about hope. In Hebrews chapter 11, in verse number 1, we read the passage there, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. May I ask you a question this morning? How do you see your future? Do we really have hope in the future? I know with what's all going on, we are all concerned, but we know that we're going to get through this. It is going to pass. But do you have real hope? You and I need hope in this life. But does it doesn't mean it's real? Do we really want to have real hope? Just because we have to hope doesn't mean we actually have hope. How do you see your life in the future? 
is greatly determined by the choices that you will make and the character that you will develop in this life that God has given us. If you believe you have no hope, you're going to live for the moment. No investment in this life. You won't give any time. Back this past year, we had a pastor come to our city and he spoke to our young people. And the matter of suicide is very dear to his heart because he had a brother that took his life. You see, his brother was uh, an amazing gentleman. He had a big church. He had a wonderful, beautiful wife, and he had everything going for him. One Saturday evening, he and his wife decided to climb uh, a cliff and to look at the beauty of the city and state that they lived in, and oh, it was gorgeous. But somehow, somewhat, while they were watching all of this, his wife slipped, and she fell off and dropped down to the ravine, and they quickly rushed her to the hospital. She was in the hospital for over six months, it didn't look good. The brother didn't preach again. He had other preachers in the church preaching for him. He just didn't have anything to really say to the people. And then finally, after six months, there was a little bit of glimmer of hope. She was coming out of the coma. And she started making improvement through therapy. And she started joining him again and the, the brother started preaching again and he had this hope and he was excited that now he had his wife back. But things turned to the worse. She developed a blood clot and she was quickly rushed to the hospital and she didn't make it. Oh, his, this, this friend just went in difficulty and went into real depression. He and his wife, prior to her losing and leaving this world, liked to watch movies. One of the movies they really enjoyed was Romeo and Juliet. And one of the things in the movie is about what would it be like in a thousand days. And his wife looked to him, what would it be like living this life in this world a thousand days from now? He remembered that. And when he got his money from the insurance, he never really recovered from the depression of losing his wife. He decided to just go enjoy life. And he traveled all around the world. He would post this on Facebook and he would tell people all about his experiences. And he says it's vain. It reminded him of Ecclesiastes that life is vain without the Lord. And he was searching and searching. But he didn't turn to the most important person in his life, the Lord. He finally reached to his thousand day. And he says, it's not real. And sadly, this pastor's brother took his life. Because of that loss of his brother, he realized he needed to give hope to people. And so he travels around to speak at churches and conferences to tell people there is hope beyond the grave. You see, Christianity is based on three things. First of all, the person of Jesus Christ. And it's based on a book, the Bible, the Word of God. And it's based on an event. The event that we're celebrating today, Resurrection Sunday, the resurrection of Christ. You see, soon after Christ left this world, 5,000 people were saved from just two sermons, the very first two sermons ever preached. Why? Because they were talking about good news. You see, the news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The question is, does it really make a difference in your life, the resurrection. I understand that the statistics say that close to 70% of Americans believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. But did it really make a difference in their lives? What we're going through today and the issues of the pandemic and the quarantine and, and loss of friends or, or family because of it, the death tally is just jumping does it really make a difference? And I have to tell you, it can make a difference. And that's what we find in our text in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You see, the church at Corinth was doubting their resurrection. They weren't doubting the fact that Christ arose from the dead because they saw that, they heard that. It was witnessed, but they were doubting. And so Paul takes the time to show them, yes, Christ has risen, and we too will follow him. In the meantime, 
He was showing the evidence. He was showing the historical facts behind the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the fact that it is true. You know, the story of the resurrection, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we find four things that are brought to our attention. The very first thing is the importance. It is important. Why is it important? Well, look with me, if you would, in the first four verses of 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel that was I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. It's important what he did, what he did on that cross is so important to all of us. And the scriptures reveal that to us. For examples, I don't want to hope in this life for nothing. I have to have a hope. For example, some of us are possibly getting ready for retirement. You've worked all your life, and some of you have worked in a, a, a job that you uh, somewhat have enjoyed, but you have stayed at that job because of the great benefit that was being promised to you of the retirement time. And you heard all about this. They preached about it. They said, we have the, one of the greatest retirement programs in all of our state. A and you constantly heard that stated, the great benefit. No one ever would come back and tell you differently. So you were looking forward to retirement. Well, you are 15 years away, 10 years, 5 years, and you reach the age of 62 and you decide, I think I'm going to retire early because I probably can make more money being retired from all these great benefits than I will make if I continue working for this company. And so that day finally came and the company threw you a party. They gave you that gold watch. And then one of the directors came and talked to you and you started to talk to him. Well, what about the retirement? Well, there is no retirement. What do you mean? No, there's nothing. There's nothing that we have to offer you. You have been constantly preaching to us about it. Well, we have, yes. Didn't it make you such a more loyal worker? Didn't it make you something excited to come to work each day because you knew there was something in the future that was waiting for you? Oh, yes, yes, it did. Were you not happier to know that one day you would be able to retire and that you would have all these luxuries and you'd live a wonderful life? Well, didn't you feel better about all of that? Yes, yes, I did. But it's not true. It's come to an end of your life and you have no money. You have nothing. You're broke. How is that hope? Many people live their life that way. They think to themselves, well, I have hope in the future. I think that something is going to happen for me in the future. Oh, I wish something will happen for me in the future. I'm planning for something to happen for me in the future. But it's not really happening. It's not happening. It's not taking place. Now, if there, that were true of Christianity, will we not be the same as those who are thinking about retirement, wishing for retirement, hoping for retirement, looking forward to retirement. And when we get there, there's absolutely nothing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and Paul states in verse number 14, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also in vain. That word preach, it's the Greek word kuro. It means to herald or to scream, or to cry out. That's what preaching means. It's to herald. It's letting people hear news. Today, we, we turn on our news, and there's really two types of news that we receive from our media and from our television. One is soft news, and the other is hard news. Soft news is the things that we can use. It's the practical things. It, it's the things of everyday life. The entertainment news, the diet tips, how to make a better resume, how to be good friends with your neighbors. 
those are all good news and things that help us. But then there's the hard news. The hard news, things that make things different in our life. It's about terrorism. It's about war. It's about pandemics that we have been going through in these recent days. Things that really make a difference in our life. And we listen and we hear. Now back in the Bible days, they didn't have newspapers. They didn't have media. They didn't have television sets. So they would have a crier. One that would go out and proclaim and scream the news of the day. Paul is saying that that's what a preacher is doing. We're heralding our news to you. And then he says, there in the verse, verse 14, our heralding is in vain. What were they doing? What were they saying? You see, heralding the good news of the gospel because it's grounded on a historical fact, something that is true. And they are telling you facts that will really make a difference in our lives, something that will cause us to look to him. In verse 14, he says, if Christ were not raised, then our heralding, that big news would just be in vain. See, Christianity is not a philosophy. Looking at a life without God, it's a fact, it's truth. It's something of how to, how to know the future. Yes, soft news comes from hard news. First, that we can enjoy the soft news that you can maybe read the book of Proverbs, wonderful soft news, or the, the teachings of our Savior Jesus Christ. But the hard news is that we have sinned and we've come short of the glory of God. And we need a Savior. We need to turn to Him. Yes, you might be planning on retirement that is just not there. There is no hope. The gospel is the good news where we do have hope, where we have the truth that Christ Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. Not only is it important, but I want you to see a second thing, that it happened. The Bible tells us that it was, that our Savior Jesus Christ, before he was crucified, was taken and scourged. They took a cat of nine tails, and that cat of nine tails was a piece of wood with some straps, nine of them, with maybe bone or metal or glass that they would use to, to whip their prisoners or the people that they were about to crucify. And they would take and scourge to literally rip the flesh off their back. The Bible tells us that's what our Savior went through. The Bible also tells us that they then put him on a cross. They nailed his hands there. They gave him a drink of vinegar. And then they were ready to take a club and break his legs so he would die a little bit quicker because it was a special time of year, Passover. But when they came to Jesus, it looked like he had already passed. And so to make sure, they took a spear and they pierced his side. And the Bible tells us that blood and water separated came gushing out of our Savior, indicating that he was dead. They took him down off that cross. They put him in a borrowed tomb. They wrapped him up in cloth. And then they sealed the tomb. But that's not all the story. On the third day, he arose from the dead. The tomb was empty. And it caused people disturbance. Later, the Bible says in chapter 4 to verses 8 that after that tomb being empty, it says people saw him and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen of Cephas, that is Peter, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. Yes, we know that on the third day that the tomb was empty. Christian apologists today tell us there are things that we know outside of the Bible that are true of the historical fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Number one, we, we understand that uh, Jesus of Nazareth died. He died on that cross. And as we think about that, that is the third thing I want you to understand. It's the evidence. It's the evidence. Is there really evidence of his death and his burial. 
And yes, there is. Outside of the Bible, there is many passages and uh, truths told to us beyond the reasonable doubt that he died by means of crucifixion, that Jesus' body was placed in a tomb. Thirdly, the disciples were shattered by their Messiah's death. They lost all hope and they ran in all different directions, hiding, fearing for their lives. Then the tomb of Jesus was found empty on that third day. There were eyewitnesses that reported a bodily appearance of Christ on several different occasions. You see, it shattered the faith of the disciples so radically that it transformed them into bold witnesses for him. Seventhly, the proclamation of the church unapologetically preached the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because of that, the church prospered. The news of his resurrection changed our day of worship, and Sunday became the very first day of the week when we would worship him. And then finally, Jesus appeared to both James and to Paul. You see, they both were unbelievers at the time. James, the half-brother, didn't believe. But when he witnessed him, when he saw him, he turned to him. Many, for a number of centuries, have to just disprove the resurrection by inventing different theories. Oh, we know some of them that have become very familiar today. One is the swoon theory. You remember the swoon theory is that Jesus really didn't die, but he fainted, and later he was revived. How did he get out of his wrapped cloth that he was wrapped with if he just fainted and came back to life. How did the stone get removed from that tomb where it was guarded by guards and he came back to consciousness without anyone's help? Yes, the swoon theory is a theory that people are trying to say that he just fainted and he came back to life. There's another one. It was the wrong tomb theory. The wrong tomb theory says that uh, Mary went to the wrong tomb and when she saw the tomb empty, she started rejoicing. And she possibly thought that she saw Jesus there in the garden and she went and ran to tell people the wrong tomb theory. Or how about the hallucination theory? He was may, maybe just one or two people kind of hallucinated seeing him. But may I remind you, as we've just read, he was seen by over 500 witnesses. You see, either Jesus rose from the dead or it was not true. Either he was alive or he was dead. Somebody stole the body. You understand the penalty for stealing a body under Roman guard is death to those guards if they allowed it to happen. The disciples who were shattered were now living their faith. They believed that they, he died and they believed that he rose again and it was the truth and their lives changed and they were willing to die for him some being crucified upside down, some being separated to a, an island, being quarantined and dipped in oil, some dying by other means. Why did they do that? Because they believed that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true. Lee Strobel says if we examine those 500 witnesses and we did it consistently during the, the matter of uh, listening to each one, each one 15 minutes to their testimony of seeing Jesus Christ, they say that it would take 128 hours, five days without stopping consistently hearing those testimonies of the 500 plus the others. Yes, may I submit to you this morning, there is evidence. And finally, I want us to see, does it make a difference? The story of the resurrection, does it make a difference? Has it taken a hold of your life? Has it made you live differently? Has it made you going through this crisis of the virus cause you to have hope because you know that one day we'll be taken up? The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, that we can be forgiven from all our sins. Listen what he says in verse number 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, and ye are yet in your sins. You see, the Bible tells us because of his death, because of his taking our place and becoming our sacrifice, no sin. No sin that Jesus didn't die for. He died for all. The Bible says that he throws our sins as far as the east 
is from the West. He does just that. He died. You understand that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is your receipt. You know, uh, sometimes uh, Pastor Sean and I like going to Costco and uh, we enjoy having the hot dog there. And we usually pick up a few items at the store while we're there besides going for the hot dog meal. And we like it because Pastor Sean and I like the price uh, that you have to pay for that hot dog and drink. But when we're leaving the store, I'll put that receipt in my pocket and somehow, some way, I, I, I'm looking through all my pockets seeing where did I put that receipt because they're not going to let me out of that store unless I show them the receipt. Finally, I find it in my pocket and I show it and they finally say, have a good day, and I'm on my way. You see, that receipt was important that I leave that store. We understand that we have a receipt the receipt of what Jesus Christ did for us, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. In verse number 18, we see the intimacy of our Savior. It says, Then they also, which are fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. Because of Christ's death on the cross, we have intimacy with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you remember when doubting Thomas doubted that Jesus Christ was really alive? and came back from the dead. He said, let me see your hands. Let me see your scars. And Jesus allowed him to touch him. Folks, that was intimacy. He was able to get close to his Lord. And he told Thomas, and he told Peter, I must go. Because when I go, I go to prepare a place for you with my Father, which is in heaven. And we'll have fellowship. We'll have intimacy one with another. He is precious to us. Have you experienced the intimacy? Have you received him as your savior? Have you trusted him to come into your heart? If not, you need to ask yourself the question. Do I really have hope for the future? Then we see that there's purpose in life. If you look at verse number 19 in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. He's telling us here that without hope, there's no afterlife. There's no purpose. He says if you're hope, hoping even in Christ in this life and not the life to come, you are most pitied. As I told you, 70% of Americans believe in the bodily resurrection, but they've never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Without the afterlife, folks, they're really is no hope and no purpose. You see, you and I have a secular society that we live in, and it's teaching us and it's telling us, when you're dead, you're dead. That's it. That's final. You get put in the ground and there's no more need for you. It affects the way we approach life, how we see the future. It affects the way we think to ourselves. I have to live for today rather than to live for tomorrow. That's why Jesus tells us there in the Gospels that they ate and drank and were merry because they didn't know that there was a future. When we look at God's word, we understand that there is a purpose. There is an afterlife after we leave this world. In the Bible, we find several different accounts. I think of the uh, man Abraham Abraham uh, was told, I'm going to bless you. And you are going to be a blessing to multitudes, to a nation. You see, God has left us here for a purpose to be a blessing and to share the great news, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The same thing was told to Isaiah. When he called him in Isaiah chapter 6, he says, Isaiah, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to use you and I'm going to send you to be a blessing. Are we a blessing? Is God using us? Something unusual happened in our home this past week. You know, uh, it's very hard to get chlorine uh, bleach. And uh, my wife had it on her list, but every time that she had sent me to the store, we didn't come up with it. But for some reason, and I don't know how, somebody had come to our door, and I had been outside back and forth, and they left a half a gallon of chlorine bleach. How did they know we needed that? Somebody wanted to be a blessing. 
Someone wanted to, to comfort others. Are we being a blessing to people? This past Friday, Pastor Sean and a few other people from our church were helping at Tamiami Fairgrounds, handing out food to people in need. Why did they do that? Because they wanted to be a blessing. They wanted to help. You see, people lined up as early as 2 a.m. And by 7 a.m., they cut it and says, we can take no more. We have run out of supplies. And then they filled their vehicles up starting at 9 o'clock. Why? Because they wanted to be a blessing. Are we a blessing? You see, God blesses us with the good news. And in turn, he wants us to share the good news with others. We have meaning. We have purpose. Are we sharing that purpose? There is life after this life. In Revelation chapter 21, the Bible says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more gain. For the former things are passed away. And he that spat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I'm Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. You see, that fountain has been springing for over 2,000 years. Christ's death settled the penalty for our sins, and he wants us to drink. At what cost? At the cost of our Savior's life. What did we pay? Nothing. It's free. For whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but has everlasting life. Simply, we believe. We open our heart. We trust Him. We want Him to be a part of our life. We want our life to count for Him. You know, the, back in the 60s, there was this person that was known as the human spider. And what he would do, he would go to different locations, big cities that would have skyscrapers, and he would literally climb the buildings. And he was kind of like the Spider-Man of today. And people were thrilled, and he would go to different cities. And one particular city he went to was there in Los Angeles. And there in Los Angeles, uh, there was a high skyscraper that he was going to climb. Crowd gathered. People were cheering, and people were clapping. They had heard about this, and now they were going to get to see it in person of this human spider that was able to climb tall buildings. And he started going up, and he seemed to have no problem. He was going from one ledge to the next, and he was pulling here and pulling there, and all of a sudden... He was kind of looking for something, and you could see his fingers trying to grip something that wasn't there. And finally, he reached up a little bit higher, and he grabbed a hold of what he thought was a piece of concrete. And it turned out it wasn't. And he fell to his death. And all the people there were, 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 were frightened and scared for this man and loss of life. And, and they quickly rushed up to him to see what was it that he had grabbed a hold of there that he fell? And as they opened his hand, it was a spider web. It was a spider web, co a cobweb that didn't give friction for him to hold himself to that building. You see, some of us are holding on to this life with our hopes and not the real hope of Jesus Christ. You can't hold on to cobwebs. You've got to hold on to the real fact of what we're celebrating today the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Have you asked him to become your personal savior? Wow, maybe God has allowed this time for some of you maybe that normally don't go to church and you've been allowing God to speak to your hearts and you are hearing the message loud and clear. He says, first of all, A, we have to admit we're sinners. Second, we have to believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross and he rose again on the third day and he's now sitting at the heavenly throne of our heavenly father. And then thirdly, it says, we must see, open our hearts to him, confess. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you thirsty today? Do you want to come to that spring that is flushing out with water that is free, that was paid by our Savior, Jesus Christ? 
He wants you to come to him. He loves you. We're going to close with an invitation song. And during this invitation, we pray that you'll get on your knees and you'll get your family members with you. And if you don't know him, would you open your heart to Christ? And if you do, would you ask the Lord to use you to be a blessing during these difficult days of the pandemic?
Thank you, Pastor, for a wonderful message, a wonderful Easter message for reminding us that there is hope in this life with Christ. There's also hope with Christ beyond the grave. If you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning, we would love to help you. Uh, please uh, click in our link that we have uh, in our web page, and we would love to help you and be a blessing to you as you start your new life in Christ. God bless you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being so good to us. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful morning and for this wonderful day, how it reminds us, Lord, what happened nearly 2,000 years ago, that you, Lord Jesus, came and you came to give us life, and not temporal life, but everlasting life, all because you went to the cross, you were obedient to the Heavenly Father, and you suffered in shame, you gave it all for us, and then on the third day you arose again, hallelujah, thank you Heavenly Father, and you're alive, and you're alive in so many hearts this morning, and we thank you for those that were listening this morning, our pastor's message of the hope that we that lies in you, that those that made decisions with you, Lord Jesus, I pray that they'll grow spiritually, and I pray that they'll continue to walk with you throughout their life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for speaking to us this morning. Continue to bless us this day as, as family, as your family. We cherish this precious moment of your glorious resurrection. And Lord, we also know that you're coming again. It's very soon. Bless us this day, we ask, and thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.